Promises Remembered. I want you to make a note of Isaiah chapter 43, verse 26. Don't ever forget it. It's where your heavenly Father beckons to you and says, Hey, remind me of all the promises that I've made to you so that I can justify you, so that we can talk about it and I can justify you. You know, it's not often the Father gives you a personal invitation to remind Him of something. Don't ever think for a moment He's forgotten. He wants to know if you've done your homework. Because before you can claim a promise, you have got to absorb it. Today we're going to talk about a promise, the greatest promise that was ever made to man. The promise of a Savior. Now we know that the, the, it was the... Uh, absolute conception that took place on this date. That's when the Holy Spirit began to dwell with us. And that's fantastic. Always when the sun's shining, make hay. Okay, Take advantage of whatever you can to teach Christ. And Christ crucified, that is to say, who crucified Him, why they crucified Him, and the price that was paid there, that you have that salvation. And God promised us that salvation way back at the beginning, even Genesis chapter 3, where he spoke of Christ that would, be, would bruise the head of the serpent, but the serpent would bruise his heels, nailing them to the cross, as a matter of fact. But the promise of his coming is a beautiful thing, and you find it in Deuteronomy chapter 18. And let's go there. Deuteronomy chapter 18. One of the promises of God. Hey, you want to talk to Him about it. You want to remind Him and you want to claim it. Don't just sit back be a do-nothing. Talk to Him. Claim the promises and be blessed. It sure beats, a, it beats having the curses. Okay, it's all, it's your baby and you walk with it. Uh, chapter 18, verse 15, God's promise of the coming one. He says here, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him you shall hearken. In other words, I'm going to raise somebody in flesh body. It's going to be just like me. This is why Jesus would say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because Christ, the Father himself wanted to pay the price for that salvation. And this is the promise, just like me. That's why he's made in the exact image, as God would say in the very beginning, let us create man in our, plural, our image. And in that particular verse, even in the second chapter, image was eth ha'adam, because it referred to Christ himself. Verse 16. According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb, in the day of the assembling, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. It, for, when God appeared in, in the natural sense, that fire on Mount Sinai, it frightened them to death. Usually when you see the supernatural, it's going to frighten you if you're not if you're the least bit off, off kelter a little bit, or it will anyway. It's awesome. But what he's saying is, I'm going to make one just like you, with gentle, pleasing, can reason with you, one that won't frighten you. I'm going to send the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about. One that has compassion and love, that you can talk to, it won't frighten you. When He touches you, it will heal you. When He leads you, you'll be blessed. That's what I'm going to do. Don't want to frighten you anymore. The magnificence of our Father. Don't ever be afraid of Him. The awesomeness of it. Fantastic. Just think, that's your Father. 17, And the Lord said unto me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken, that it frightened them. 18, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. 
He was the living Word. The Word became flesh and it walked among us in, in, a, in a person, in the personage of Jesus Christ that we could love, could even touch, could understand without being frightened. What a, what a loving God we have that He could see the needs of the people and what it took to communicate. You see, if you don't communicate, you can never have peace. Even in families, if you don't communicate, you're not going to have peace. So communication is a wonderful thing. And that's why the Father wanted in person, here, to communicate, to commune with you. 19, and it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. And then he continues on about, you're going to have a few false prophets. Well, how do I know a false prophet? Well, what he says won't come true. Well, what does that mean? It means that God didn't talk to him. Because if God sends one like he sent Christ, every word he speaks is true. And it, things will come to pass exactly as they're written. You can count on it. It is written. And that's that. Amen. That's being the meaning of amen. And I want you to think now for a moment. You might make a note of it. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. We're not going to turn there because all of you remember it. A virgin shall conceive and will bear a child. And you will call that child Emmanuel, being translated into English, God with us. The very presence of God. You've got to absorb that. Christ, as gentle as he was, when he walked by, it was Emmanuel, God with us. Do you know something? That's one of the greatest promises God ever made to you was that he would send that one. He would be like you. He would be in a flesh body showing you how to overcome the flesh. Though we all slip up, though we all fall short, we can't be like as he was. But in as much as we can't be as he was, he paid a price that you can be forgiven for your shortcomings. What a gift and what a promise from God. Did you ever talk to him about it? Thank him for having sent that one, showing us the example of how to get it done. And yet knowing that his wing overshadows you to protect you, to lead you, and to guide you because God, when he said, remind me of my promises, let's talk about it. So don't, don't rob yourself of not talking to him about the promises. Well, how do I know the promises? Study his word to show yourself approved, rightly dividing that word, that those promises become real to you. And you walk with him. He walks with you. You communicate with him through the word and spirit, and he communicates with you. It's the blessing and the promise of God. But hey, don't be one of these people that say, well, I, nothing ever happens to me. Well, you never do anything. You never talk to him. T prayer is simply talking to him with your problems and being honest because he can read your mind. He knows if you're trying to con him, trying to soft soap him, trying to get something your way over someone. He knows it coming out the gate. Always be honest with him and be blessed. Yes? Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. A virgin shall conceive. You will, she will bear a child, and you will call him Emmanuel, which is to say, God with us. Now, turn to, in as much as we quoted Isaiah, let's go to Isaiah chapter 45.
God's promises didn't start yesterday. They began in the first earth age. You need to pick up on that. You need to take the blinders off and understand his word. Verse 7 of chapter 45, this has to do with Cyrus, but a type of the Christ coming one. Verse 7, I, God speaking, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and I create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. It just so happens that that word evil, I create evil, it's tumult. Okay? In other words, if you disobey enough, I can cause a little problem in your life, but it shouldn't be translated evil, be that as it may. Verse 8, drop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. That, that's right. Let the earth open and let them bring forth salvation. That's the one sent. And let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. He created this earth. Long, he's going to tell you in a moment just about how long ago. Verse 9. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherd of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioned it, what makest thou? Or thy work, he hath no hands. He's clumsy, he's awkward. Look how he messed me up. Don't you ever say that to the Father. That will not get you many points. Okay. He created you as he created everything. In the beauty and the wonder of this world. He is the creator. That's why he is your Father. He created your very soul because he wanted someone just like you. Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begattest thou? Or to the woman, What hast thou brought forth? Uh, kind of like a slam in the Hebrew, like, can't you do any better than that? Well, you're it. So make the best of it, commune with father, and boy, will everyone be, will your parents be proud. 11, thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his, and his Maker, ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. In other words, if you want to know something, ask me. There's no gender in that. It means sons and daughters. Okay. 12, I have made the earth and created man upon it, flesh man. I even... My hands have stretched out the heavens, and all their host have I commanded. Everything you see up there in the sky, I put it right there, right where I want it. I'm in control. I'm your father. Should make you real proud that he has that awesome ability. 13, I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. And he shall build my city, and he shall let go my captives, not for a price nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. 14. Thus saith the Lord, the labor of Egypt and merchandise of Ethiopia and the Sabaeans, men of stature, shall come over unto thee, and they shall be thine. They shall come after thee in chains. They shall come over, and they shall fall down unto thee. They shall make supplication unto thee, saying, Surely God is in thee, and there is none else. There is no God. In other words, there's no other God. 15. Verily, thou art a God that hideth thyself, O God of Israel, the Savior. In other words, your work is a mystery to some people. Beloved, don't let it be to you. Rip the veil of those things that have been kept hidden by understanding the first earth age and what happened there. And then you find that God never works in a mystery. It's all wide open. It's just that people have lack of understanding. Why? They won't remind him of the promises. They, they, they are too proud to ask him for a little help. They shall be ashamed and also confounded, all of them. They shall go to confusion together. They are makers of idols. They like to worship whatever they can find, whatever they can make. It may be a business. It may be a job. It, it could be most anything. They just like to do that. Okay. 
And, and uh, instead of, so it's so easy to love him, especially after he sent that one. 17, but Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. We're not just playing part-time stuff. Everlasting. You shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end or even unto the end of the world. You're going to have it there with him, for him, and by him. 18, for thus saith the Lord that created the heavens. Listen carefully. God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. Don't you ever forget that. That's very, very important. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. It was wonderful. The, the word vain here is tuhu. It means utterly void and destroyed. He didn't create it that way. I am the Lord and there is none else. This explains the second verse in Genesis chapter 1 where it states the word, the, where it says the world was void and without form. Uh-uh. The, be, the world became void and without form. God, God doesn't create anything in a destroyed sense. He, he's a better manager than that. It was destroyed at Satan's rebellion. That's what he's letting you know here. I didn't make it void. I created it to be inhabited. It was beautiful. Everything in its proper place. Everything as it should be. Verse 19, I have not spoken in secret, not if you'll open your eyes and look. In a dark place of the earth, I said unto the seed of Jacob, Seek ye me in vain? Uh-uh. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. I don't try to hide things from you. And I don't want you to try to seek me in destruction. Find me in the beauty of the habitation, and as it shall be. Verse 20, assemble yourselves, and come, draw near together ye that are escaped of the nations that have no knowledge that set up uh, the wood and their graven images and pray unto a God that cannot save. And, and beloved, listen to me. If you're studying with a group that's going to fly away, Guess who they're going with? It's not our Father. For He has never written, I'll fly you away. As a matter of fact, in Ezekiel 13, He says, I'm against it. He wants you to stand against the corruption, the deception, as it's written in Mark 13. You have a destiny and a purpose. And that's why He sent that Savior. Not, not a part-time thing, but eternal. Tell ye, this 21, tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? In the first earth age, who declared this even back then? He did. Who hath told it from that time? Question. God's elect have. Have not I the Lord, and there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior? There is none else beside me. And so it is. 22. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is none else. You're not going to find salvation anywhere else. Well, I, I, they told me all I had to do was just not even study the book of Revelations and just fly away. And I was saved. That's not what God says. Who did you believe? Who deceived you? Who, who has you eating out of Satan's hand? You don't need that. You rather need the word of God and the promise of God. Hey, remind him of his promise. Talk to him about it. Tell him you want better understanding of it and clarity. Clarify it. He'll do it. When you communicate with him, he invited you to talk to him. Don't ever forget to if you have any doubts. 
23, I have sworn, I have sworn by myself the word is gone out. It, you can't swear by any greater than God. Of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. On the first day of the millennium, you have a great part in that, beloved, as one of God's elect in bringing that first day of the millennium to pass and how precious it is. 24, surely shall one say, in the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. 25 to complete. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. A destiny, beloved. Listen to the word of God. God did not create this earth void and without form, as many would have you believe. It was beautiful. And you know something? It's going back to that. He's going to rejuvenate it again. That's what Revelation 21 stipulates. Even though it says new, in the Greek it's rejuvenate. And God himself will bring that forth and how precious it is. And he opens it to whomsoever will. Turn over to the, the 49th chapter of this same book. Isaiah 49 verse 1. Listen, O isles, unto me. And hearken, you people from far, the Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And he has, the Savior. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me and made me a polished shaft. In this quiver hath he hid me. And, and there hidden 30 years in Nazareth, and then the ministry became. And his tongue is a sharp two-edged sword. God's word cuts both ways, but it's always healing. It's always protecting, always blessing, unless you've really gone the wrong path. Three, and said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. In other words, the prince of God is going to come forth from this people. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. Um, I'm going to have the victory. Listen, times are rough and there are influences that draw people away from the truth. So be it. Don't you waver. It will look as though you're losing ground. You're not. You've read the back of the book. We win. Okay. So don't ever be discouraged. Don't let a little bad news get you down. Okay. Because this is the good news. And that tongue is sharper than a two-edged sword. Nothing, nothing can stand in its way. Verse 5, And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him, to be the Savior. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. God always gives you your strength if you'll ask him, if you'll remind him. That's his promise. Promised it in the Psalms and many other places. Do you latch on to that strength in your life or do you just float along in weakness? Don't do that. Be strong and be of good courage in the Lord God Almighty. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. Whomsoever will. Everyone that believes upon that one promise, the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got eternal life. How blessed you are. It's God's promise. Remind him of that promise and hang on to it. Do that that is right. 
communicate with Almighty God and be blessed. Be of good courage, for God will never leave thee. He will never forsake you. Seven, thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel. That's kinsman redeemer. Okay. Why? Because you're his kin. And his Holy One, to, whom, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth, to a servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship because of the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. Why, he loves you. Verse 8, Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time, you're coming up on it, my friends, be ready. And have, uh, have I heard thee? And in the day of salvation have I helped thee? He'll do it. Hey, you understand that's a promise also for you? Do you want his help? Remind him. And I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. What a time for a destiny and a purpose serving the living God that thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth to them that are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed in the ways of their pastures shall, and their pastures shall be in all high places, feeding on the word of God, the sheep of the Lord. Verse 10 to complete this chapter. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor the sun smite them, for he that hath mercy on them shall lead them, even by the springs of water shall he guide them. Those deep springs that run deep. It's called truth. And truth is always a winner for our people. Hey, do you know something? That's his promise to you. Claim it. But you've got to do a little more than claim it. You've got to talk to him about it. You know, when you have that moment, if you ever waver, hey, talk to him. Be of good courage. Do not be afraid. God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. That's his promise. Remind him. If you ever get to feeling lonely and say, I'm just all alone. No, you're not. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. That's his promise. So that brings us to the time that this promise came forth. Luke chapter 2. There we've been covering that promise in the Old Testament. In, in this chapter, it comes to life. The Holy Spirit began to dwell with us at conception. And we thank our Father for that. But then there came that time. At the time of full delivery. This event transpired. Chapter 2, verse 1. Luke. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. That's to say enrolled or registered. It's a census taking time, just as it is for us this coming year. Two, and this taxing was first made when Cyrenus was governor of Syria. Verse three, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. That's to say place of birth. Four, and Joseph, this is Mary's husband, which had nothing to do with the birth of Christ. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, unto, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. And so it was. Mary's father was also of the lineage of the house of David. Her mother was, of, was a Levite. Her lineage was of Aaron. Verse 5, to, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child, it's time. 
And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Seven. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And here the Son of God, the richest person that would ever be, born in a, in a manger for animals in the world, showing that he came here for us, for people, not to kings and queens only, but also if they believe. But here God saw fit to set this example to show you he wanted someone, just as he had promised, just like you, just like you, that this prophet would come. And here he is, this babe, swaddled and in that manger eight. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock at night. This is one of the things that lets you know it's not December the 25th, all right? But that's, that's well and good. That's when the Holy Spirit began dwelling with us, the conception. Verse 9, And lo, listen carefully, what happened? And lo, the angel of the Lord <coughs> came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. <clears throat> that supernatural influence will do that to you. But do you understand who the angel of the Lord is? That's the very spirit of God himself. That's God's presence with us in spiritual form, usually known as the Holy Spirit also. He delivered this message. This was his only begotten child. This was Emmanuel, God with us. He promised, he delivered, and we have a Savior. <clears throat> Verse 10, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. How, how many was that again? Was that just Israel? Or, no, all people everywhere. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. And so it was. That day, that blessed day, we had that Christ, Jesus Christ. Jesus means what in the Hebrew tongue? Yeshua, Yahweh's Savior, sent salvation to one and to all whom would believe. And Christ, Christ in the Greek tongue is Christos, which means the anointed one, like we anoint with oil. That's the etymology of his name, as rubbing anointing with oil. Our blessing, God's promise, he delivered, and you have him. That one that had a tongue as sharp as a two-edged sword, if anyone moved against his children, you are those children. He protects you. He strengthens you. When you remind him, when you talk to him, the promises of God. This is why when we started, and that verse is so ever important to you, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 26. Remind me of my promises. Let's talk about it so that I can justify you. Do you know what justify you means? So that I can make it right and just for you. So that I can help you communicate with him. That's what he wants. That babe would grow to be that one that would be crucified. And even while he was in the tomb, he went back to all of those and set the prisoners free. All the way back to the time of Noah, he made salvation available to those born before salvation was possible. That is to say, except through the law, which is a, a, almost an impossibility. And he freed them. 
Well, why did God do that? Because He loves all of His children. Communicate with Him. He loves you, and you are at that time of conception. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for the privilege of serving you. Thank you, Father, for your many promises that we remind you and communicate with you about, Father. Bless these and let them be a blessing to all they come in contact with, Father. We ask it in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting light in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Heaven right here on earth. You know, this is, this is where... Chapter 14 of Zechariah, I can teach the whole book of Revelation basically, practically, from that 14th chapter. And what it does, what most people don't realize, as it's written in Revelation 21, heaven's going to be right here on earth. God, in Ezekiel 16, performed a wedding with Mount Zion, that is to say the land of Judea. It's his favorite spot in the universe. And that's where he intends to set his eternal temple. So, therefore, that, those two verses describe heaven on earth. That's where it's going to be. Uh, Revelation 21, and especially verses 20 through 24, draw that out and expand upon it. Patty from Kentucky. I was wondering if on the ark, if the cherubim had wingspan, as they depict the ark nowadays, what is the significance of the wings since angels and Satan don't have wings to cover the ark? Thank you. I love your program. You've helped us a lot. Well, thank you. I'm glad the Father's Word does it. It really does. The reason the cherubim are drawn with wings on the ark is descriptive of their title and profession. They are, many times we are told as to come under the wing of God, as the great eagle's wing, that we are to come under his wing. Well, God doesn't have wings. But it's a descriptive way of saying, as the eagle would protect her young under the wing, so God protects us uh, in his love. And, and what it means, go to Ezekiel chapter 28. And Satan, who was one of those cherubims, because he was the cherubim that covereth. That's the reason for the wing. It describes he, those that covered the mercy seat, which simply means they protected it. They were supposed to, but guess what? Satan, uh, first of all, the ark which Moses created was symbolic of that ark, the true ark, okay? the mercy seat and all. And so it was. But that was simply descriptive of his name. He, he decided he wanted to sit on it. He wanted to be Messiah. But only God could do that. That's where the trouble came in, as you will read in Ezekiel 28. Verses 18 and 19 tell you what's going to happen to him. Donald from Texas. I would like to know more about <clears throat> you speaking on the Kenites. Have you got a tape on that? And if so, what is the number of it that I can order it? 436 will help you on that. Kenites is simply a Hebrew word that means the children or offspring of Cain. And Christ speaks of them himself. He taught of them in Mark 13, beginning with verse 36. He talked of Cain and Cain's children in St. John chapter 8, uh, verse 44 even tells them who their father is. 
wasn't our father. <clears throat> That's uh, where you'll find it. You will find also in 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55, that they were already bookkeepers for the tribe of Judah way back then in Chronicles. When you have a bookkeeper that's um, a child of Cain, you're about ready for a heap of hurt. They found out the hard way, and they still do to this day. Alice from Tennessee. What was the light that was created on the first day? And the Urach, the Holy Spirit, moved upon the waters. The light was, was if you want to go that far, was Christ himself at the foundations of this earth age. You could, John, St. John, in the chapter one, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And uh, that was the light, was God himself, Emmanuel, with us, as his spirit moved and brought the creation as it is. That's the light, it was the spiritual hope of the world. Uh, Darla from California. Is it possible for someone to have a curse put on them that will last for three generations? Absolutely not. No one can put a curse on a Christian. I know some religions, some cults, teach that they can. And if you listen to the cult, they might get the job done. But if you're a true Christian, you have power, as it's written in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, over all your enemies. Satan and his little curses run from you. They're afraid of you. If you, op if you occupy this house, your body, in the name of Jesus Christ and order stuff like that away from you, ricochets off of you like a bullet. And you're, you're a can-do type uh, person. You, you're a child of God. Utilize the power that he freely gave you if you believe. Again, Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Linda from California. I was told by my pastor that if I didn't pay my tithes on time, I would have to pay an extra 5% based on Leviticus 27, 30, and 31. Well, he's got a real good thing going there, you know. Um, uh, I, I really think he's stretching Leviticus 27 and 31 to almost the breaking point. And uh, well, probably the reason you didn't pay your tithes on, tithes on time is you didn't have anything to tithe. Tithe is not one set. It's, it's, if, you have, if, if you had... Um, um, a tithe, then certainly you have to make something before you have a tithe to give in the first place. You know, God loves a cheerful giver and any preacher that begs or would make a statement like this, guess what he's in it for? I mean, what's on his mind and what is it he bears down for? For your salvation and your, you to love Almighty God or, or your change and your money and 5%. Uh, does that sound like Judas to you? You think about it. I don't know where you go to church, but he's misleading you with uh, that little statement. Uh, I, Irina, Irina from uh, Connecticut. What is the meaning of 666 and 777? Well, it's, it's just really the simplest thing in the world. 666 is the sixth seal, sixth trump, and the sixth vial. When you read the book of Revelation, what happens in those particular seals, trumps, and vials? Satan appears as Antichrist. He's coming. And then what, what is 777? Well, it's the seventh seal, the seventh trump, and the seventh vial. What happens at the seventh seal, seventh trump, seventh vial? Christ returns. Now, most people know that six comes before seven. Therefore, they know that Antichrist appears before the true Christ does and that they have the obligation to speak out against him as Mark 13 declares. So there's 
666 and 777 is so simple a child can understand, okay? Okay, uh, we got uh, Mincy from Tennessee. Uh, are the names of the two men that died uh, beside Christ, uh, my, my mother told me their names were in the Bible, but I haven't been able to find them, nor have I heard them in any lesson. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, your mother was mistaken, okay? The two men that died behind him, they're not in the canonized Bible, okay? They're just not there. But what's really important about the two <clears throat> is one was converted. One of them Christ redeemed right there on the cross because he became a believer. Jesus loved him. Even as Jesus was dying on the cross, he loved that one and redeemed him. Kinsman Redeemer in action right up to the last breath uh, at, in the flesh body. Samuel from Pennsylvania. I uh, also have a question. The Bible seems to teach that the elect are chosen by God through His grace, not of any works man has done. The pastor teaches that the elect are chosen because of works they performed in the first earth age. Can you explain or recommend a tape about the elect? Yep, we have a tape titled The Elect that will help you. But, uh, if, uh, you know, there's no great mystery there. All you have to do is read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, uh, concerning God's elect. He said, I chose you before the foundations of this earth age. Now, if God chose you before the foundation of this earth age, where were you? Well, you were before this earth age. You were with him in the first earth age. Well, why would he choose you? Because you were fighting against Satan then and you still do to this day. That's why he can trust you. That's why he chose you as it is written in Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Sometimes you don't even know what to pray for. So he intercedes in elect's life. Why? Because he chose them, pre predestined them in the first earth age whereby he can count on them and interfere in their lives to bring to pass prophecy as it is written even in this earth age. That's what God's elect are. They're not special and they're not chosen for any reason other than they work for him big time, even in the first earth age. And they detest Satan and his deception. Pat from Ohio. Does the United States come from Manasseh and Ephraim? In, in part, you betcha there. And so it is. Uh, Gene from Montana. Uh, a lot. Of, maybe I should explain just another word or two there. Uh, naturally, the all 12 tribes went north over the Caucasus Mountains and were later called Caucasians. I'm sorry, all 10 tribes. And the, the 10 tribes that were taken captive by the Assyrian. And they settled Europe, and many of them later migrating to the United States of America. And England, Great Britain, and the Americas, Christian nations, as with other Christian nations, are the scattering of those people, absolutely. Gene from Montana. Is the fig tree referring to Israel as a nation? In part, but it has to do with the land of Judea and when Israel would become a nation again there that God would plant, as written in Jeremiah 24, both a good fig and a bad fig. This is why it tests the scholar of God's word that you know who's who. You better know who the Kenites are. And you better know who the children of God are. And uh, those prophecies, Jesus didn't say, maybe you should learn the parable of the fig tree in the very chapter I've been telling you about where God's elect are delivered up before the Antichrist, Mark 13, where you, he definitely says you're going to be delivered up. You're not to premeditate what you'll say beforehand, but speak what the Holy Spirit gives you at that moment. He says, learn the parable of the fig tree. He didn't say maybe get around to it. He said learn it, and he meant it. Anybody that needs help on that, we have a tape titled that very same subject. Wanda from Arizona. I was told by a lady that I am worshiping the flag. She said, 
she said uh, I was putting that before God. I told her I didn't worship the flag, but I do love what it stands for, and that's 100% correct, okay? I do love our country and what the flag stands for. She says she won't vote because Christians put the government before God. That's a bunch of malarkey. I don't know who that lady is, but she's a little bit on the ignorant side. Uh, you know, to worship something, that becomes your whole thing. But God's people have always had standards. That's what a flag is. And it, it represents that people. And we, you, you can pledge that allegiance to the flag that does not take one whit away from God. God promised that we would become a strong nation as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea. And so it is. God blesses America. And uh, there's a reason for it. And so it is. There's no accident that we're the superpower of superpowers in these end times. It all fits scripture exactly right. Ezekiel, uh, Isaiah chapter 18. Question for television, Scott from Minnesota. What does Genesis chapter 4 verse 21 say that Jubal was the father of all such as Hanel the harp and organ? Does this verse really mean that anyone who is uh, an organist for, of their church is from the seed line of Cain or all church organists automatically Kenites? Of course not. It just so happened that Jubal was pretty good at it, but they were good at a lot of things, okay? You can't, you know, and, and even, uh, let, let, me, let me make one thing real clear. Even if a person was a child of Cain, a Kenite, and they loved the Lord Jesus Christ instead of Satan, then they do not become a child of Satan, but they become a child of God. And, and are in good standing with God. Even a Kenite can have salvation and be redeemed. So, um, so let, let that be square away in your mind, all right? But certainly um, church organists are very valuable to the church and the profession and the talent in which they put forth if your church uh, uh, allows and goes has that music. David played a harp and an organ is simply a offspring thereof, basically. Um, and, but uh, that has nothing, it's what one believes, but also Kenites are definitely a race, but they can rise above that race. Maxine from Kansas. I have often wondered if you have any information what happened between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I watch you every day at 6 a.m., with them, um, okay, that's great, appreciate it. And um, so, uh, there, you know, you have history itself. Uh, we, um, there are works, but history itself gives us that accounting, and um, Josephus gives us that accounting, which is a pretty good history, and a history that can be pretty well trusted. Tim from Kentucky. Pastor Murray, would you please explain 1 Corinthians 13, 10, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is part shall be uh, done away. Thank you for your answer. You're welcome. What it means is, is when Christ comes, he is perfect. We see now, and when we were a child, we acted as a child, but when we matured, we began to put childish things away. We're talking about Christians. But when, the true, when Christ returns and he that is perfect is with us, naturally we're changed into spiritual bodies. And there's no in part after that. We've got the bold truth 100% uh, right before us. That's what it's talking about, Christ return. Uh, Shirley from New York. My baby sister died at birth while she still, will she still be a baby when I see her? Or will she grow up in heaven? Uh, she was born in 1950. Also, my husband passed in 200, 2005. He was 69, a good Christian man. Will he be older? We're all in the spiritual bodies. We're all the same age. 
God created the bodies basically as it is written in, in Proverbs chapter 8 and um, in Job chapter 38 and, uh, at the same time. God loves his children and age has nothing to do with a spiritual body. It doesn't get old, it doesn't get sick, it doesn't wither, it's not perishable as flesh bodies are and um, they're all mature. And when we change to the spiritual body, that's as you are, even eternal for some. Neil from Michigan, I was wondering if you could touch on this slaying in the spirit thing. I fear it is not real. If, if it is real, I don't believe our Lord could do things like this. Uh, your thoughts on this, simplify and simplify return. God picks one up, doesn't knock one down. It is true that in the very presence of God, one usually will hit the deck. I can use that terminology, simplify, you understand. But then the first thing he will say is, get up, be a man, act like a man, look like a man. And uh, certainly um, I, I do not understand how some people can, can realize when, when what part of man is slain is the old man that likes to sin and the new one that is brought forth is one that loves to please God. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. That's why he sent you the letter so you could read it with understanding and be pleasing to him where he can bless you. You bless him, boy, will he bless you. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, again, bless God. He will always bless you. Most important though, you listen to me, listen good now. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.